Right, thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here to the Geological Society to this first Strix lecture, uh, which uh, has been generously sponsored by Google. Um, and that's why it's all about one man, or it all stems from one man, and that man is Tony Kent. Quite a remarkable man who died in 1997. Um, his working life divides itself rather neatly into three phases, punctuated by two major life-changing decisions. He was always interested in nature, especially birds, and we'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, so it seemed quite natural that uh, he became a zoologist and did a degree and a PhD in zoology and ended up as a lecturer in zoology at the University of Nottingham. Um, he actually lived just outside Nottingham in a little village called Attenborough, where there is a nature reserve, the Attenborough Nature Reserve, more or less at the bottom of his garden, so he could do, go out of his garden through a gate into the nature reserve and do research on, on, on birds and so on. Um, he accumulated quite a lot of data as a result of his research, which he thought he, he ought to have a better way of handling, and he decided he would use a computer. The university had a computer. He was entitled to use it, so he thought, ah, oh, I'll use the, the uh, computer to handle my information, to store and retrieve it. He looked for some software that would do what he wanted, couldn't find any. That's where his entrepreneurial spirit kicked in. He sat down, taught himself programming, and wrote himself some software to do what he wanted. Uh, that was quite early in the history of using computers for information retrieval, and so, lo and behold, he was an instant expert. Uh, at the same time, the Royal Society of Chemistry, or then its predecessor, the Chemical Society, was getting interested in using computers for information retrieval, and they set up a little research unit at Nottingham, and uh, I'm delighted to see two of my colleagues from those days with us, uh, Barry Wyatt and, and uh, Ash Carby. Um, they were going to set up this research unit and they set it up with an advisory committee. Tony was an expert in information retrieval and using computers, so he got invited to join the advisory committee. Then came the first of the major decision points. I remember him telling me, quite out of the blue, he got a phone call from the vice-chancellor of the university, who was a man called Fred Dainton, later Lord Dainton, a chemist, saying, you know this unit that the RSC is setting up, and you're on the advisory committee, they want somebody to run it full-time. Will you do it? And this meant giving up his job as a lecturer in zoology. But he swallowed hard and thought about it and said yes. So that then moved him into the second phase of his, uh, of his career, where he was working with the Chemical Society, which later became the Royal Society of Chemistry, on using computers for chemical information. He wrote a software package to, uh, to search the chemical abstracts tapes and provide a service. And that uh, little unit evolved into a thing some of you may have come across called UKIS, UKCIS, the UK Chemical Information Service. And it moved from being purely research to start charging for its services. It then became inappropriate for it to remain as part of the university. So it moved into the Chemical Society. And uh, over a period of years, it grew from an initial five people to 10, 12, 15, 20. Uh, eventually, it uh, assumed some of the other information activities that went on in the Royal Society of Chemistry, book publishing, journal publishing, uh, the library, one or two administrative functions. And Tony proved himself a very able administrator, a very able entrepreneur, and uh, a good people manager. Uh, and in the end, he found himself looking after something like 300 people and a turnover of several million pounds a year. Now, the senior man at the Royal Society of Chemistry bore the title at that time of the General Secretary. It's a man called John Ruck Keane, who'd been there for many, many years. And uh, he was coming up to retirement. He actually only died last year at the age of, I think, 94. Um, so he was coming up to retirement and there appeared to be an expectation that Tony 
would be the logical su successor for him. Um, I never actually heard officially that he was offered the job, but I, I think he probably was. And he had to sit down and think, is that really what he wanted to do? Did he really want to be... Uh, it would be a very prestigious position, um, but it would also be uh, uh, a lot of administration and a fair amount of politicking because the RSC, like all these learned societies, is run by a whole lot of boards and committees staffed by uh, professors of chemistry and that sort of thing. Um, did he really want to do that? In the end, in 1980, he decided no, he didn't. So he left. And uh, he then started to work with uh, some other colleagues, uh, principally a man called Derek Barlow, who was his uh, equivalent in what used to be the Institute of Electrical Engineers, I think it's called something else now, and Jan, who we'll come to in a moment. Um, so that was the end of his second phase and moved him into the third phase that Jan is going to talk about. Just before he does that, I'll just give a little background for the Strix Award. Um, when Tony died in 1997 and a group of us who knew him wanted to do something in his memory and we set up this award, we used, Tony had used ornithological terms for his software, including the major one, the Strix package, which Jan is going to talk about. Uh, so we adopted the Strix as the um, motive for the award. The Strix is a genus of owls. And so there is the Strix Award, and we'll let the owl watch what goes on from here on. Um, that's actually, I believe, a tawny owl, Strix Aluco. So that's just a very brief background to Tony Kent and the Strix Award. Uh, and that's now my cue to shut up and hand over to Jan, who's going to talk about the third phase of Tony's work and some of the things that went on there. <coughs> Um, well, the, the, this very event testifies to uh, the pioneering work that Tony did before I met him. Um, just one other thing, a little detail to add to um, what, what we've just heard is that uh, Jenny Kent, his, who, who was to become his wife, uh, she was working with him on the, it, the, the computer was one of the original Leo um, Lions Electronic Office, and uh, they were they were programming together in machine code, and uh, so when I met Tony, um, it was after a couple of years after he had uh, bailed out of the great job that he could have had, and he bailed out. It was a very brave thing to do because. He had an idea for a text database. Database, we'll get to that. And, um, you know, it was just him and Jenny. And uh, I met him in 1985. Uh, it was, um, I was actually looking for computer aided retrieval of microfiche because my job was the analysis of hundreds and thousands of newspaper articles, and I thought it would be a jolly useful thing to get computers involved and microfiche and everything, save a lot of work. And so I, uh, there, was a, there was a little tiny ad in the, uh, in the Times, and uh, computer-aided microfiche, Imtech, which was one of the scores of little companies then beginning to manufacture various sorts of Unix boxes. And uh, I phoned up, and the salesman couldn't make head nor tail of what I was talking about. Um, and so he said he very generously gave me Tony's number. And uh, about, I phoned him up and invited him to lunch. And two weeks later, uh, we had lunch in Chimes, which was just starting as a. And uh, I tried to explain to him what I was on about, and he tried to explain to me what Strix was on about, and there was, I must say, two or three ciders and a great deal of beard pulling, because 
Tony, I don't know if you remember, when he was thinking hard, he used to pull his beard. And uh, beginning to be a fair amount of teasing about whether or not I was crazy. Um, and uh, so the next thing that happened was that I was, after that, we decided to meet again, and I was invited up to his farmhouse, farmhouse in outside of Nottingham, Newark. And uh, it was the middle of winter. It wasn't furnished. It was very, very cold. And uh, we sat in front of a log fire and uh, ate off the ground. And then next morning, that was my sort of moment of revelation. We went out into an even colder office, and there was this Intech box, and on it was version 2.1 of Strix. And uh, that's when I, as a, you know, I, I didn't know about Boolean operators. I didn't know about free text retrieval. And suddenly there was this whole world that was being introduced to me. And that, you know, yes, uh, Boolean operators are what we use all the time. Every time we go shopping, every time we make make any kind of food. It's and or, not this, maybe we should have this, etc. And so that filled me with huge excitement. So then what happened was that we decided to carry on the relationship and he had a job in London once a week, two day job once a week. And <clears throat> this Imtech box was about that big and it was not even a luggable, but somehow he managed to lug that computer on the train down to London once a week, because we only had the one computer. And I remember I used to meet him at Warren Street Underground, and the computer would change hands, and I'd take it away for the day, work on Strix and try and learn you know, what could be done with it. And then he'd stay overnight with me, and we'd talk about what I'd learned and ideas of the future and all that kind of thing. And. Uh, that went on for about 18 months. So I learned a hell of a lot. And um, then this is the picture, the picture of me looking a bit younger. And Tony, uh, one of the high points, Jenny, who he'd been working with in 1967, finally became his wife in 1987. And I was great, great privilege of being the best man at his wedding. So I've had a little bit of fun here with, you know, where the title is about Boolean algebra, so I'm making a bit of a story. And so these are the, these are the, uh, what the essence of Strix was that it was a database. This was Tony's vision, was that it was a database that used all the powers that could be mustered then of information retrieval, free text. But the key is a database, and the database is something that is structured and built. It's not like information retrieval where you've got a mass of information you're trying to make sense of, trying to get something back from. It's a database, so you start at the beginning. And we combined things because we came from different worlds. I mean, very the world of databases and the world of information retrieval at the time, completely separate. And uh, I think they still probably are pretty separate that Strix combined them both. And so then I came along because my, my work dealt with, for years and years, faceted taxonomies. And so although Tony was, you know, uh, free text retrieval, he was fascinated by what you could do with faceted, fac faceted taxonomies. We called them um, <clears throat> multivariate classification schemas. And um, so, that was another and, that we put something together. And then the other thing that still isn't really being done, I don't think, is the combination of pre-coordinate processing, which is you get an article or an item and you classify it before it goes in. And it's a little extra time, but you make a lot of advantage at the other end of the process. But then we combine that with the post-coordinate, which Strix was massively good at, again, we had something new. Um, together, um, we were both into providing people with full functionality, but at a price that people could afford. Tony's vision was very much bring it to the people. 
and uh, you know it had to be affordable. And in those days, affordable was something like 360 pounds for an MOSDOS system. It became cheaper, and I remember persuading him to do a mini strix at 65 pounds, which was. And so we, 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 we worked on all these things for, um, I guess, a couple of years. And then we decided to, I, I had a company called Trend Monitor, and Microbell was the, uh, the, the company that uh, Tony had. And we, it was a good way of working together, and I think I recommend it, is that we both went on each other's boards and we exchanged 10% of each other's companies. Not too close, and yet very close. So um, those are the ands. We've got some ors. We, we were looking at a very big market because my idea was to use database publishing, something that you could publish, that you could only publish because you had the information in a database, because you'd added value to it that way. And he had the whole gamut of information management tools and that kind of application. Um, there was, t Strix had the alphabetically, the Boolean chop, the alphabetical list, but it also had numeric capabilities, which was totally new at the time. Integer validated fields that records could be added, very simple, added, subtracted, averaged, those kinds of things, but a showing that a movement in that direction. And the other thing that Tony sets and set searching, building of sets, I believe is the way that, you know, a proper inquiry into, into you can't know what to search for all at once. So you build a set, you save the set, other sets, combine sets, and then you get to the conclusion. And what Tony did, which was, he was cared desperately that it could be usable by ordinary people, and he kept that process very simple. And I'll show you it in a minute. And yeah, we wanted to have both professional and amateurs being able to use it. He was very much into, as I say, it should be a power tool for people. He was absolutely obsessed with processor efficiency and speed. Those were the things that really gave him a buzz, is processor efficiency, he had, Strix was very similar. He, he, he was inspired by a program that I'm sure a lot of you know called Basis. And Strix did about 90% of what Basis did. But it did it in 256K to begin with. And that shows you know, how demanding his own standards were. Um, speed of retrieval, what really excited him was to get that search file going made up, maybe two seconds quicker, making it go faster. We'll get a little bit to it. His, his, he always started with practical utility, always started with user needs. He was not a great fan of the academic science of information. I've got a little quote coming on that. We were both very much into using this, these tools to enhance people's ability to use computers, not to have an external artificial intelligence make it easy for them. He believed, and I have some quotes saying, is that people, in order to access information intelligently, need to use their mind. And that's what the, other, the, the unfortunate thing, in a way, was that we were both I guess this is an end, but you know, we were both into development and new ideas and all the excitement, but neither of us were very good at or very interested in marketing. So, but, but Strix did, we did, we did manage to sell about 450 copies at about 350 pounds each. So that's a market, a small one compared with Google, but it start. And uh, we were both very much passion not to work for people working for ourselves at home. This is a bit of fun. It's, um, you know, I always wonder what the use of XOR is really. 
Um, I'm sure there's a use for it, but you could, this is a use for it. We were both, um, you know, he was born in Singapore, I was born in Accra. I'd never been to Singapore, he'd never been to Accra. But there was something that was fun of, and, and an and about that, is that it meant that we were both colonials. We were not part of the sort of British establishment. And, you know, he used to tease me, mercilessly. I'm, I'm a Canadian, and, uh, you know, being the colonial. I knew about Canadian history. His actual thesis in biology was on the color change in minnows. That was what, you know, um, we go through that. He, uh, he's, I spoke French, and his first language was Chinese, because in Singapore, his ayah, his nurse, was Chinese. I always wondered whether that might have done something to his mind and uh, something rather good. Um, so here we are. Microbell was Tony's company, which I ended up 10% I had. Strix is the product. The outside there is the box. Um, that's Nipper sitting on the manual that I wrote. And on the, uh, the screen, up there is, is an actual running copy of Strix running in um, an old version of Windows 98 in a DOS box. Um, here's the manual. Uh, the, one of the things about Tony and Microbell as a company is he was absolutely devoted to customers. That was his priority. What customers wanted and looking after customers. And he used to travel hundreds of miles all over the country, fixing things for customers, talking to them on the phone, um, always being in good humor. He always called, you know, he always called his customers idiots. He always said that, you know, computer users are experts and very intelligent in their own field, but when it comes to computers, they're idiots, and you've got to treat them as idiots and you know, help them as much as possible. So um, that was our brochure. I didn't do this brochure because I always said that one. We, we, had, a, we had an agent called John Crowther who did this, and I always said this is too complex, too busy, nobody's going to read it. But it is worth reading, and um, you know, it has all the detail there, but not as a brochure. Here we have... Um, I, I presume you can read them. This gives an idea of the kinds of areas which we sold into. And it's not a bad list, and there was a lot more. And uh, that's despite not really very much being spent on marketing, not really very much at all. So we got to that. Here's something that, um, just one example, is Interpol. We had Interpol. And I just want to uh, read what Interpol said. We got it into Interpol, and I quote, The Bureau says that so far as... So, I can't read it with these. Okay. The Bureau says that so far it has realized a 20 to 30 fold increase in efficiency with this system. It has cut paperwork, duplication, and a lot of legwork, and numerous tasks have been restructured and assigned to civilian personnel without losing police expertise and accountability. This, this stuff. And then it also, Interpol also said, although search commands in Strix are based on Boolean logic, the Bureau reports that the learning period for inexperienced operators is quite short. After a couple of hours of training, most new operators could initiate basic searches without help. A mark of the system's success, the Bureau says, is that staff now prefer to work on other inquiries until a terminal, because it was all time-sharing then, until the terminal became free so that they could use Strix rather than go back to the old methods. Now, on the basis of that, we 
put in an app. Well, there was a there was a tender then for the system, the police system, which became Holmes. And Holmes had a very, very sticky beginning, and I think it's still pretty sticky. Um, and it cost many, many millions, and God knows how much was wasted. Well, we did put into that, and we got, I don't know, up to the, whatever, the two or three stages in. And then we were quoting 300,000, I remember that. And when the, the, the proposal was rejected, one of the reasons that they rejected it was because it was too cheap. <laughs> so here we are. I didn't promise bells and whistles. That's the front, the main menu. Very straightforward. The thing that is most important is database definition. This, we get back to the database theme here, is that databases are not something you just do, like a Google search or something like that. They have to be thought about. And the first thing you've got to think about is the purpose of them. So what I've done is I, just to prove that Strix did work on my old computer, I decided to define a database that, if I could get the information in, would work with the kind of data that I'm using now. And so I called it Metamon. Metamon is what I'm doing at the moment. And here it is, I hope. Yes. Now, my purpose is very straightforward with this stuff. What are, I'm a content analyst, and from the process of content, an content analysis, uh, you can derive intelligence from an information source. And, uh, you know, what I need to know, and I need to know the statistics, who is saying what to whom and when. All those pieces of information need to be collected and so this is the field structure. Databases have fields. And I won't go into it all, but you know that covers my needs. A couple of points about it is I won't, you know, this is all the whole fields and word by word fields. Word by word fields means that every word is searchable. But one interesting little bit up there is that the plus and minus signs there is that each field can be password protected or not. Now, me as a, somebody who was a hopeful database or a wannabe database publisher, that was really important because you could give away bits and then get people to pay for the bits that were password protected. Um, there it is. Minimalist input. That's all it is. Woe betide you if you made a mistake because the editor was not that good. Um, there is another minimalist thing, which is the um, command line, the search. But if you look underneath that list of green across the bottoms, very standard. Tony always thought of the user first, and that's the way the user. So look, if we went F2, commands for search, that's the list of commands, quite a lot. But the other thing was that key word, I mean, um, in, in it, contextual help was very much in his priorities. And so if you went F1, select help, all those things you'd get the lowdown to what to do. Everything was there. Although I wrote the manual, it wasn't really needed. You know, it was all here. What I want to do is uh, look at... through this. Look at combine. Let's do that. This is the most concentrated basic knowledge about text information retrieval and Boolean algebra anywhere I believe possibly in the universe because you know he said it all in two pages. And so you've got the definitions. The thing again about sets um, typical of Tony was the right-hand rule. He reckoned that 
you know, Boolean expressions, algebraic ex bracket as expressions, which is what people were using at the time, was too difficult for ordinary people. And so he just made the right-hand rule. So you do it and do it, and then on the right, it takes into consideration everything on the left. No brackets. You could also combine set numbers with, with the words you wanted, and uh, Bob's your uncle, really. So that's what it, you know, it's fairly standard. It looks like that when you search. And it's an and or not. I did a little bit of inputting, but uh, only a tiny bit. Um, this is what interested me most, and this gets a bit deep in a way. That is the search file. The search file, the way Strix works, and I think that Tony was one of the first people, not the, he said he was not the person that invented the Boolean chop. Somebody else did, I don't know who. But the Boolean chop, as I'm sure you all know, is that if something is in the first half of an alphabet within a field or in the second half, and then chop down until you get to this position. So if the, if the data grows by two times, you've only got one more chop. And so unlike other databases, the bigger it got, it didn't really appreciably slow down. And that was one of the big things. The other big thing about it as a database, compared with what was going on then, was that databases take a great deal of programming. Anybody like you that works in SQL and all those worlds know that it's a lot of hard work and that every search needs to be defined in some way and worked out in SQL. Well, what Tony claimed was that using this, you could have a database that people themselves could design and operate, don't need programmers. Now, my own interest here is that, you know, I'm into sort of hierarchical stuff, and Tony had a, I think, I might be wrong, this hatted thing. We call the little hats there, and you could make if you hatted the terms together when you were inputting, they would treat them as single words, but all the hatted ones together would also be a word. And so what this was doing for me was that I could, once I got my classifications in there, Strix in the search file would keep all the counts that I needed. The counts, who is saying what, to whom, how often, all that. And so perfect, wonderful. The problem was that it was impossible for me to use because who is going to put hats in and type it all out? Just too difficult. So what we did, while all this was going on, I had a company called Trend Monitor. And we did this all, continued doing it on paper. And uh, we called Trend Monitor the information refinery. That kind of says it what we were doing. There's some information refiners here who've come very kindly. And what we had was um, literally hundreds of publications that we would monitor. We would cut out all the articles that were important. And then we would classify them into files. And what we were is monitoring the flow of information through the classification system. So that you could see, if you were talking about something at one time, under the same classification, we, we did it quarterly. Trend Monitor was, we, we, we actually, I'll, I'll show you more in a minute, but Trend Monitor was quite well recognized. And uh, like Tony and Mike Rebell, we managed to sell about, ooh, I think it was about 400 subscriptions at an average of a couple of hundred pounds each. We covered the areas of computing, communications, and media. And we kept this flow going through the physical files for five years so that you would be able to compare back in time, like with like. And from that, you could begin to look at and talk about trends, both statistically and in terms of the content. Uh, we sold it for... Uh, it, the, 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 the flaw, the fatal flaw with Trend Monitor was that we were backed by Aslib and worked very closely with um, uh, Aslib. Um, 
Ron, Richard Coleman. I don't know many of you would know Richard Coleman, but he was a great supporter. But the problem was that the better we got at it, the more we did, the bigger the books got every quarter. And this is what they look like. They're in a filing cabinet now, um, all there. A database, a snapshot of the dawn of the information age, five years. It's outside the internet. It's in my filing cabinet. Um, I've always felt that was a bit of a pity. I don't know what can be done about it. But in some way, maybe they could be scanned in or something. And so, um, but that was the problem. All our money, in the end, went on printing. Well, most of it. And so the better we got at it, the more money we spent on the printing, and the less money was spent on us, the people who were doing the work. And um, we had to close it down, unfortunately. But the way it did work was that we, this is an example of computing. So a fairly standard hierarchy. We got hardware and software. Uh, things to note that even back then there were things called optical computers and molecular computers. And to just you know, re-emphasize re, re the point, if we had kept going, I would know now what was going on with optical computers, if anything. Don't know. But it would have gone in that box. And so software, I called those subjects actors things in the world. But then what we did was each of those was classified into another facet, completely different, which we called issues. And issues worked over those five years. I mean, all these things improve with time. But that was a particularly powerful thing. So you could ask, the, you know, our... The database, our database, would tell you what was being said about performance, for example, of mainframe, of, of mainframe computers, what was being said in one period, one quarter, compare it with what was being said with another quarter. And, you know, people found that pretty useful, I think. Um, but the price got too high. The other thing that's quite interesting is that while we were, we were monitoring computers, communications, and media, well, in about 1992, something like that, Articles began to turn up, which wouldn't fit. They were part of what we were monitoring, but they didn't fit. And so, you know, a content analyst, um, you know, basically, if it doesn't fit, and our people will know this very well, you put it in a don't knows, and you let the don't knows build up, and then you go back and have a look at the don't knows, and what we came up with was socio technologies. And so that then became part of the monitoring process and cost more money to print. But uh, um, there it was. And so schemas evolve in that way. Going back to the beginning again, the very first thing, when I first met Tony, I was working on putting this book together which was the first bit of, I'm a Canadian, I came over here for completely irrational reasons and got kind of stuck. And uh, I thought, well, I've got to do something, and so let me do what I was doing in Canada. So I wrote this book, which is another snapshot, an even earlier snapshot. And uh, I, I'm going to start using some of Tony's words now. So I'm going to read you his words. Uh, that is here. He was, t he could be, as many of you who knew him, he was such a generous character. And yet, as any master, and I, he was a, was a master, not master-slave, master-student relationship. And, you know, he could tease, and he didn't give praise easily. But when he gave it, by God, it meant something. And so, anyway, I'll just read a bit of this. I mean, the other thing, I'll just pick out... He said in the foreword to this book, um, and very, very difficult to get Tony to write anything in English. Very difficult. He could write things in C, but he, you know, so this is a great honor. <laughs> um, and he said, it's an old, it's old fashioned and rather boring to talk about indexing and classification as 
a means of organizing access to information. And then after some lovely things that he said, I just want to read this one bit. In my close association with Jan Wiley, during the conception and preparation of the report, has convinced me that the techniques which have been used to derive the synthesis from the raw material are appropriate for, the, for use within computer and networking systems. Wow, we got there. Though the essential underlying research strategy has been that of content analysis, Jan Wiley has added a framework of classification and cross-referencing that is well suited in computerized systems of information organization and analysis while remaining intelligible to ordinary people. We always want it to be intelligible. And here is a little example of Tony being I think you just read this. I won't read it out. <coughs> Idiots and halfwits. He was very, very straight speaking. And this was, this was uh, something that when I was edited in a magazine for Aslib called The Intelligent Enterprise. And uh, at the end, at the end of this article, after at the end of this article, he says, and I'm, this, I think this is relevant to what Susan is going to be presenting, and uh, I'll try and read this. Uh, in conclusion, this was after, this was the same article right at the bottom. In conclusion, by all means, let us have some frank exchanges of views among experts. But let us make sure that we also ask the practitioners and users to tell us what they want and how they would like to get at it, especially with some degree of objectivity. Let us apply the procedures of science to the evaluation of, of the information art. He often used the term black art art and practice. No science there. And stop kidding ourselves that there is or ever will be a science of information or even an information science. So that's where he was coming from and I think that's what um, Susan is going to be talking about. There's an epilogue. I'm the epilogue and my colleague Simon Eaton. I haven't given up. We still do pre-coordinate classification. I really do it now as, I'm a forester now, but I do this late at night because it's addictive. And you know, once you know what you can know, it's very hard to stop yourself. And so I'm, I've got, I, 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 I'm very simple at the moment. I'm using Firefox bookmarks, drag and drop. That's what we needed in Strix. And that's what we would have had if Tony hadn't died. We were in the process of putting it into Windows, into the world of drag and drop, and everything stopped. And it was awful. And, but I never really stopped the, you know, as Tony would have said, beavering away. And we're still beavering away, so I cover these areas now. And I believe that hierarchical classification and Boolean algebra is the way human <coughs> minds naturally work. It's what I call the local loop from information to the mind. Once you've got a classification, a new layer of sense comes up. So here we have economy, markets. We'll go to the next screen. So that all opens up in that. I've got hundreds and hundreds under each of these categories. And by definition, they're not just relevant they're pertinent, because I put them there. <laughs> no computer. We don't have to justify any kind of search algorithm or anything. It is my opinion, but hell, I've been doing it, and it does work. So here we can see, OK, look, look, crisis and default. Now, I reckon people ought to know that, that one. And there's a lot like that. The idea, generally, was to, there's, there's, there's dynamite in all of these. 
Um, but the idea was to use economy to fund what is my and Tony's greatest passion, which is the environment. And I won't go into, I, I, I can talk about this for hours, but I obviously won't. Um, one of the rules of making these kinds of schemas, taxonomies, is that you have to use neutral, neutral, absolutely neutral language. And so, for example, under environmental change, impacts, life, that then subdivides into human and non-human. Now, non-human, I used to call ecocide. Bad. That's pulling at people's heartstrings. No, it's just non-human. And so they, you know, for example, life also divides down into human and all the awful things that climate, that environmental change does to human, but the biggest category, and this is another thing with what we do, is count, count, count. The biggest category is remediation. Massive. That then divides down into technology remediation, political remediation, et cetera, et cetera. That's what gives it meaning. So, as I say, I better, I better not get stuck here because I could go on for too long. And uh, I've got about five minutes left, I think. Um, I have another person that I've been collaborating with, and that's Simon Eaton, who really, when Tony died, you know, it, it, it destroyed all our lives. And, uh, you know, we've had to, somehow we got it back together again. And Simon Eaton, in a way, took up, took up the mission, the database concept. And I can say that I now have a drag and drop database, which I can use 25 years later. Except Simon goes a lot further because he thinks that, um, you know, well, he's talking about topologies. I mean, one thing is a database, and Tony used to say this too, a database is useful, useless unless you know what's in it. It's not a thing that you, you can't search without some idea of what's there first. And so Simon is using Boolean algebra to make a visual record. And that diagram up there is actually a diagram that he's picked out about um, dark matter. Well, I think it's very appropriate because, you know, that unknown stuff is dark matter. And if you can get some kind of shape that you can manipulate, um, what I used to call in the old days hyperdimensional, but he calls... Uh, data space, uh, then you can have people engage actively, not be the passive recipients of something that is given to you because you've done a search and you don't really know how that works, but something that is created by yourself. Now, everybody tells me that, I know there are people from Google here, that the success of Google is absolutely necessary because people are too lazy to think. They don't want to think. They want it done for them. Well, Tony felt very strongly as I, as you come back here again, finding useful information is an intelligent process requiring intelligent people because at the end of the day, only the intelligent can recognize what is useful. So, Fate had it that I ended up with the copyright of Strix. I also ended up with the source code. I've got runtime code as well. And shortly after he died, uh, we all agreed that what we wanted to do was make that open source. That was a very long time ago, but nobody, the spirit didn't move us until now. But we've collected more or less everything together that we need. And I believe that there are some very, very good open source people here already. What we want to do is make this 
database, not information retrieval, a database with full text information retrieval capabilities as well as the ability to structure it available forever to whoever wants to use it and then develop it, <laughs> develop into whatever it might become in the future. Don't know. But um, that's, on the, that's on the table. And so in conclusion, you know, maybe the, the, the title of this, the ending of the speech is quite appropriate, is 200th anniversary of Boole and the beginning of Boolean algebra. Maybe the Boolean universe has not been lost, but found again 200 years later. So I'm hoping that we can begin to develop this open source software into something real. Thank you. Thank you, Jan, for a very uh, stimulating talk. Um, we have time for some questions before tea. Um, we've got roving microphones. <clears throat> if you do have a question, put your hand up, but please don't talk until you get the microphone. And when you do, sort of hold it and talk into it like that. I'm just trying to switch this on. You on, Chris? On here first. Hi, uh, Andrew McFarlane from City University. Um, firstly, what uh, license uh, are you using for Strix? Secondly, do you have any plans to put it on uh, the system on a source code repository like SourceFord or, or GitHub? My answer to that is I don't know. That's one of the reasons I'm, you know, here to find out because I'm I'm a forester now. I'm out of touch. Um, I'm, I monitor what I monitor, but it all sounds great. Yeah, wherever it ought to be, I'm willing to take advice. I don't know. I'll give you my card. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Can I just ask? Are you actually actively looking for people to collaborate on, yes, on doing this thing? Very right. Much okay. So. I, mean, so I don't your want invitation. to control it or anything like that. I just want to put it out there and to be, for it to be picked up by the world. So Tony Russell Rose from UX Labs. Could you just say a little bit more about what you had in mind, uh, the vision of drag and drop for Boolean? What, what kind of things were you thinking about? Uh, well, let's go back to this. Um, all that is drag and drop. Now, if I was going to try and get this kind of information into Strix, I'd have had to do a lot of typing. So a lot of it is done just in one hit. Very quick, very easy, um, takes a fraction of a second. If you know your schema or your taxonomy, bing, bing, bing. So speed is the most important thing. Okay, so, so Ease and speed. Can you hold the microphone to your mouth? I mean, we're talking about <laughs> pre-coordinate, yes? Yeah, OK. Yeah. So, so my, my, in case people didn't hear, I was asking whether it was for the categorization of the data rather than for the articulation of the query, which was the other use case that I had in mind. Um, well, the query is that um, once we have a database, yeah. instead of just it's, it's pretty useless at the moment, in turn, you, know, I have, I, you get to denial, and then you've got a long list, and then you can subdivide that. But basically, in terms of a database, you'd be able to combine that with free text searching of, and to begin to develop underlying statistics as well. And uh, that's, that's what I'm hungry for. Because you know, a content analyst in a database, once you've got those statistics, as I was saying before, you can see what the data is beginning to say. Yeah? Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Hello, my name is Maria Kingma. 
Um, 33 years ago, in my, f in my first job back in the Netherlands, I remember our library using a program called Strix. Of course, Fred Van Bremen. <laughs> Fred van Bremen was one of our great supporters and was... Van we, we Bremen, yes, yes, exactly, van Bremen. Yeah. Yeah, I, used, I used to work for the Council of State and we had that program as a f uh, one of the first uh, catalogue programmes back yeah. then. I mean, we were all through the, Brit the, the, the Netherlands government and very many Netherlands department, health, everything. Fred mm. van Bremen did a great job. Good, so, well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see you back after 33 years. <laughs> <laughs> One down. Oh, okay. Lee Picton, uh, formerly Trend Monitor. Uh, when can we see the new visual boolean system on the market or <laughs> be able to get, get our hands on it? Ask Simon. <laughs> um, I don't know, but uh, it's taken a long time. Simon, who writes the software, is he's... he's done it all by himself and uh, he's not very well but he does persevere and perseverance furthers and uh, as I say I've not got it working on my computer and to you know one of the things is being stuck in the middle of Devon working on a woodland you I don't get out to I'm not interested in selling anything um, beyond that I'm retired from trying to sell I'm never never any good at it and now I just don't do it and so if somebody comes along and wants to take it up Great. I'm sure Simon. Simon is very, very, I'm not allowed to talk too much about it because, um, you know, he's keeps his cards close to his chest because, because the visual part of it, if we show too much from his point of view, we've given away his crown jewels. So, you know, I don't know the answer, but I hope it won't be too long. Hello. Have you looked at uh, the Apache Lucene uh, pro uh, project? How does it uh, compare with that? I don't know anything about it. I know that Simon Software runs on Apache. Hello. I wonder if you could you remind us again what year Tony Kent was born? And I also wondered if he'd discuss with you his intention of setting up the Strix Award. Um, no, because um, he didn't expect to die at all. He wasn't, he just... Yes. Um, it no, was, the the, the Strix so Award was totally posthumous. It was after his death. Yes. So he knew nothing about it. And Tony died, I think he must have been... He died in 1997. 1997, yeah. And I think he might have been 62 then, or something like that. I, I don't really know. You saw the picture of him in 87 when he got married. I can't remember, but uh, yeah, he, he died much, 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 much too young. Yes. yes. Uh, my husband says he was born in 1933. Just okay. My husband's got Parkinson's, so he can't remember. 1933. 1933. Okay. Could you just repeat that for the recording? Yes. Um, my husband, Dr. Ash Carby, worked with Tony Kent. Did he? And, um, hmm? and Doug Hill. Tony Kent, 1933, as far as I know. Thank you. Okay, Susan. Are there any more questions? Uh, I, I have one. Um, you, you were talking there about Tony um, being very much in favour of the human intelligence rather than machine intelligence. And there seems to be more and more emphasis on artificial intelligence and its growth. And I was reading something in the paper the other day about the growth of robotics and it's going to take over this, that and the other. I feel that's rather dangerous. Do you have a view on that? My view is very much Tony's. And, um, you know, the, the, the problem with the way things are going is that it's taking away human agency, making people more irresponsible. They're not responsible for what knowledge they have Google is responsible, and uh, I do think that's very dangerous. And um, you know, I wonder who benefits from that, from a populace that doesn't think. Does Tony believe that people should think and that the software should help them think? So I personally do think it's dangerous and very depressing. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I look forward to the day when the first car crash occurs of a car being driven by a robot and somebody sues somebody. Well, quite. I mean, we've, that, that's a, absolutely who gets, who's responsible. Yeah. Nobody's responsible. So there it is. I go on about that for quite some time. Started writing about, art I had a category, artificial intelligence, in that 1984 one. All right. And, you know, we watched it then. And, in fact, probably many people know of Donald Mickey. And uh, Donald Mickey was uh, a great pioneer in that area. And uh, I remember he once told me that it's much, much easier to send something to Mars than to actually get... A, we had milk floats then <laughs> to get a milk float to deliver milk. And so that's, you know, the milk float is a car. And they have done pretty good things to get it to do that, but anyway, um, I don't think we should get started on that one. Right, are there any further questions? I don't know whether tea will be ready yet, because we're a little bit early, but oh. we, can, we can break and you oh. can uh, have... Oh, there's one there. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Charlie Hull from Flax, and, and we're open source guys, so I'll be talking to you later. Um, just This is a slightly left field question, but I noticed the logo on the manual, the Strix manual, uh, reminded me of something, and I think it reminded me of something. QR to do the, codes. No, the BBC Micro. Did Acorn come, uh, ever come and try and tell you off about that, or do you have a fight about who could use an owl in their logo? They didn't, no. Um, <laughs> I, th I think we might have predated them. Maybe we should talk to them. Why not? Maybe they owe you some money. Fantastic. <laughs> Maybe they owe you some money for the project. <laughs> <laughs>